Well, hello and welcome to Belong Church. I'm so glad that you're here with us on this first weekend in October. The Texas Fair is coming up. Then before you know it, it's going to be all the fall festivals and then it'll be Thanksgiving and then it'll be Christmas. Someone just posted um, on social media this past week how many weeks it was until Christmas and all the, uh, all the stuff. It's just like, oh my gosh, it seems crazy. I know I've mentioned it a couple of times in the message that, hey, it's going to be here before you know it and shoot, here we are. It's um, just really crazy how just time flies and we got some cooler weather this week and it's just, it's wonderful all the way around. I don't know about you, but it's, it's really cool when I think I might have to wear a jacket outside when it was just you know, not that long ago, several days ago or weeks ago that were, you know, in the hundreds, you know, still. So it's just kind of cool to see the, the difference in the weather. And if where you're watching, you don't have that, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know some other people that are watching are in Pennsylvania and you got a lot more cooler than what we've got going on. But anyway, I think it's pretty cool. Today, I'm so excited about the message. Um, this is one of those, and next week's will be as well, that I just couldn't wait. I almost called Michael and said, hey, can you come early because I just want to get these things recorded because I'm just so, so excited. And there's, there's so much about the Bible that is meant to be like where we live. And it's meant to be just like, hey, this is a tool to help you get through life. And so many times, I, so much of the time, I feel like we don't do that. I think so much of the time, people from the outside will look at it um, the, the church and, and the Christian walk or discipleship or however Christ following, however you want to say it, and just look at it as, you know, the people who think they're better than us or the people who, you know, you fill in the blank. I mean, there's so many misconceptions with it. But the thing that I get going, that I try to convey over and over in my messages is that God meant for us to do life with him. He wants to share with us his plan for our life. Him showing us that, hey, we're not alone in our life and that we're not just out here just trying to figure it out, out on our own and just, you know, the, the Bob out in the middle of the ocean that's just like just sitting there, it's like just trying to tread water, okay? That's not at all what God has planned. And so today, God falls right into that whole thing that this is where the rubber meets the road. And that is this that Jesus came to earth as a man. Now, I've said this before, but it bears repeating that his plan, oftentimes people think, is just to come and give a sacrifice to pay for our sins, which thank God for Jesus doing that. I cannot be more thankful about that because I am not capable of paying for my own sins. And the Bible says that every wage is, is required of sin. The wages of sin are death, in fact. In other words, we're not getting out of this, this world alive, but beyond that, without the sacrifice, we're going to have to give an account for everything, and there's just no way we can give an account. There's no way we can talk our way out of it. And there's nothing, it's going to require something of us, but Jesus came and did that. So I, I'm, getting, I'm getting sidetracked. But Many people will just have the view, and I, I have to say, I did as well for the longest time, that Jesus was coming to the earth was just to die on the cross. And I'm not minimizing that. That is the most amazing, that's the most spectacular, it's the most superlative thing of Jesus coming here and paying for my sins so I don't have to. That's amazing. But if that was all he came for, he could have came as a 33-year-old. He could have just dropped down on the earth, walked out, proved that he was the son of God, and, you know, the thing, one thing would lead to another, and they, they crucify him, and he pays for our sins, and then he is just, you know, made that sacrifice for us. That could be the easiest thing in the world, but, you know, that's not how he came. He came as a baby, as we will look at, and not that long from now when we do the Christmas messages and leading up to Christmas, but he came as a baby and he was raised as we are. That means he had the toddler stage. He had the five-year-old stage. He had the seven-year-old. He went to Hebrew school to learn Hebrew, even though his father is God, okay? He was a man and he walked through all the stages as being a man. 
Now, yes, he was a physical male, but I'm saying he was as the flesh and blood of what we are. The Bible says he was tempted as we are tempted. So what that means is that he faced every single temptation in his manhood that you and I will face. I want you to stop and think about that because that is mind-blowing. So I've had a particularly difficult week this week and depression has tried to like stick its claws into my head. And I know I'm not the only one. And I've talked about a couple of weeks ago that we're heading into the season where this is the most rampant and this is the most difficult time for many, many people. So I'm not alone in that. But you see, even when I face that depression that's trying to stick its claws into my brain and try and pull me down and make me just go crawl in my bed and pull the covers over my head and not come out for a while. Jesus faced that same temptation. He faced that same struggle. So Jesus coming and living a life just like we're living it equals the playing field between God and man. See, before Jesus, you could literally and authentically say, God, you don't understand me. And in our minds, that would make sense because you're up there and everything's perfect in heaven. Okay, You're not worried about how you're going to pay your electric bill. You're not worried about the inflation prices of how much food has gone up, but my my income hasn't gone up. You you wouldn't be able to say, Jesus, God, you don't you don't understand what it's like to be here. You see, Jesus coming as a man, Jesus being faced with the same temptations, having the same vulnerabilities as we have. He can relate to us, but more importantly, we can now relate to him. Because not only did he face it, but he showed how to go through each of the things without losing it. See, because Jesus faced all these temptations, but he didn't take them. Jesse DePlanis said years ago, he goes, man, I get plenty of opportunities to fail. I'm tempted to fail so much. I just don't take any of them. And that's great. And I wish that I were better at not taking any of the temptations I have to stumble or to be, you know, to do the wrong thing or to say the wrong thing. And, you know, you say those things and you're like, oh, I wish I could just reach out and grab that and pull it back. And, and I'm sure that I'm the only one that faces this. You've probably never faced something like that. But obviously I'm bit trying to be funny. But he faced that and showed us how we can go through life. That's the whole purpose of him being here. But I want to show our, the vulnerability that he had. And I want to kind of uh, more, make it more specific to focus. As he's gone through his life, he's now been with the disciples for over three years, 24 hours a day, every single day. Okay, they didn't just work eight hours a day and they all go to their separate places. They just ate together. They lived together. They walked together. They were with each other for the whole time. That's the way disciples were. And rabbis had disciples, so Jesus wasn't the only one. That was t common for that. So that was par for the course for that time. But after they've been with him for all this time, he now knows what's coming. He's been trying to tell them what's coming of the crucifixion and telling them all these different, you know, foreshadowing of things that were going to go on. And he's trying to tell them, and they're not getting it. And so on the night before his betrayal, he had communion. We talk about communion a lot. And he changed it all up on them as I like to kind of go in a deep dive with that usually about that. And he, he went through this whole thing and explained to them, hey, so this isn't just the Passover as you know it. This isn't just what you've always done every year of your life. But hey, this is now going to be my body that's broken. And they're like, oh, what? This is going to be the cup. It's going to not just be the cup that you take the fourth cup of the Passover Seder, but this is actually a representation of I'm going to spill my blood. And they're like, we don't understand. What are you talking about blood? I mean, this is just like a regular Passover. And now you're doing this stuff. So he leaves that time of trying to tell them, knowing that all the stuff is going to go down the next day. And he tells the 12, hey, we're going to go to the garden and we're going to pray. Come with me. You know the story likely. That the 12 go with him and, and they find a place, goes, okay, y'all wait here. And they took three of them, his, his closest three, and they went further into the garden with him. He left them and he went a little bit deeper in to pray alone. But he said, hey, listen, I need you guys to pray. Pray. 
and, and kind of express them, hey, this is going to be difficult. I need you to pray. Not only for me, but you need to pray too. I mean, right before that, he told Peter, hey, the devil is asked to sift you like wheat. But Peter, I prayed for you. He goes, Jesus, uh, you know, I'm skipping through some of this. He, later on, he says, Jesus, I wouldn't allow anything to happen to you. And he goes, Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to have denied me three times. But I'm praying for you. Which is still the most amazing thought that Jesus was praying for Peter, knowing he was going to betray him. Knowing this is going to happen, Jesus still prayed for him. That's why we still pray for people, because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how God's going to turn things around. And that's I, I'm going to go down a bunny path. I have to stop there. But he takes the 12, leaves them there, takes the three a little bit further deeper, and then he goes and he comes back and he finds them asleep. Not only the 12, which would be technically the nine, but then the three, the closest ones to them. So he goes and says, hey guys, I really need you praying. Please wake up. I mean, you don't understand what's about to happen, but I really need you to pray. Yeah, 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 Jesus. He goes back through. They fall asleep again. He comes back again. Man, I need you praying. The third time he's like, man, can't you pray for for one hour? Have you ever been frustrated with people? Maybe those that you really just like, hey, I really need you right now. And they let you down. See, can I show you that in the life of Jesus, we were never meant to do life alone. Jesus came as a man to showcase how to live. And even in that, he had his three closest people, and then he had the nine others, so he had the 12. So the three were in the 12, but he had the 12, and then he had the three that were the closest to him. See, God said when he created Adam, it is not good that man should be alone. That hasn't changed. It's not good for us to be alone, and when we find ourselves being alone, that's when we can really find ourselves in danger. Jesus himself took the nine with the 12 with him to pray and then the three deeper in. And, you know, he kept going back to them to check on them, but say, hey, you're sleeping. Come on. Now, certainly we need our spouses and I'm not trying to take anything away from that. Certainly the reference from Adam was talking about he needed a wife. He needed a help me. But I want to tell you, I believe it's not just limited to a half help me. But I believe that it is very true that man or woman is not gender related. It's not good that you're just by yourself and you're just trying to do life alone. We also need the threes around us, the ones who are the most close to us, the ones we can share our guts with. The ones we can kind of just tell everything that's going on and we'll hold each other, you know, in prayer. And, you know, man, I, I don't know what to say to you, but, I, I, man, I, I'll listen. Then the twelves around us that, you know, the people we just enjoy being around that we just hang out. We got the same thing in common. You know, we, we go to the same church. We listen to the same concerts. We listen to blah, blah, blah. You fill in the blank. See, there's the ones that are super close to us and the ones who are maybe the extended ones that aren't as close, but they're still, you know, very. We need those. We need to also be that to others. In other words, it's not good for me to be alone, but it's not good for those that I'm around that I don't interact, interact with them and engage in their lives. There needs to be people that I'm in their three group. There needs to be those that I'm in their 12 group. Maybe I'm not as close to them, but I'm still there to encourage them. I'm still there to be, hey, I'm here for you if you need it. We talked about a few weeks ago the, the group of four guys that carried their friend on a stretcher and they took him to where Jesus was in a, in a meeting in this person's house. And they couldn't get in because it was packed. There's no more room. They're like, sorry, there's no room. So they got up and ripped the, ripped the roof off. We need some friends like that in our lives. We need those. See, it wasn't good for him to be alone. If he was alone, he would have never got to Jesus. Can I tell you, that's the same for you and for me. And I want to tell you, and I'm revealing today that that was modeled by Jesus for me. It was modeled by Jesus for you. See, our fourth core value as a church is to make a difference. You are ultimately created to make a difference with your life, but also with your life involved with others. 
with those three, with the 12, with those that my wife and I talk about are your garden, those people whose lives you're just intertwined with. And very often it's work relationships because those are the people you spend 40 plus hours a week with, right? And you're there interacting with them and spending time with them and getting to know, hey, how was your weekend? What'd you do here? And when I worked at Church on the Rock in Palmetto and Sarasota, one of the greatest things about being on staff there was our staff meetings. And Pastor Tad would have us, all the pastors in, in the staff meeting and go around the room, tell them about your week, weekend. What'd you do? Tell me about your kids. Tell me what's going on. One, 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 one. It took hours. See, he wanted to know everything that's going on in our lives. Then he would share everything's going on in his life. Extremely vulnerable things. Things that I'm like, I don't know that I would have shared that with people who work for me. Yet he trusted us. He entrusted us with this knowledge of intimacy. See, he was surrounding himself with people. Now, probably none of us were in his three group. We're not going to get the, the most intimate of all the details. He had those people, but we weren't in that group. But we were there and we were that back and forth that we all knew amongst each other what was going on in everyone's life. What, whose kid was having this difficulty and what. And it, it gave us empathy for them. It gave us love for them. It gave us ways to pray for them. And man, I'm telling you, still some of the closest relationships that I, I have that I cherish or was in that pastoral group. That if I see them today, just about every single one of them, it would put a smile on my face and I would just light up and just run and give them the biggest hug. Because those intimacies of those times of just hearing and learning what's going on. See, we are to be an encouragement to those who are around us. And it may not be, as I've said, the, in the 12 group, we may not be as intimate, but we should still be encouraging to them and to everyone we go. One of the things that I love most about my job is that I get to interact with so many people in so many various different um, environments and different backgrounds and people that if I weren't doing this job, I would probably never ever have a conversation with. And I get to have the conversations with CEOs and CFOs and COOs and all the people on the C level and, and all of these things, these really wealthy people and, and then some of the, the, the lowest of people in the socioeconomic um, status, you know, people that are, you know, still got dirt on their pants from having worked all day. And, you know, it just, it, it's just crazy. The, the spectrum that is there and I'm trying and I'm purposing to be there for each one of them at whatever level I can and to build intentionality and to build relationships. And I'm on the hunt for my three. I'm, I'm on the hunt for the three that are going to be the closest to me. And, and throughout my life, there's been different times and different seasons. And sometimes it's that I was more of a friend to them than they were to me. And, and you know, it, it's Pastor Sherman used to say it this way. You're on the ladder of success. And you're on this rung of the ladder. And there should be people on the same level rungs with you that you're, you're doing life. You're, you're, your peers, you're side by side with. But there should be the ones above you that you're trying to catch and learn from them and to catch from them what they're doing. But there should be people on the ladders below you that you're, you've got your hand out reaching to help them back up. So there's many different ways to see it or express it, but the same thing is true. We need to have relationships and we need to be intentional with what we do. But can I point out the other part of that story of Jesus? Just as we often experience the ones that Jesus needed in his vulnerability failed him in his hour of need. And he said to them, I, I think in a little bit of frustration, you could not hang out here with me and even pray for one hour. Now, certainly they didn't understand the seriousness. And I feel like if they could go back, they would go, oh man, I'm, I'm gonna drink a, a shot of espresso or something, you know, I'm gonna pinch myself and I'm not gonna, I'm walking around and not sit still so I'm not gonna fall down and go to sleep. You know, they would certainly have a different level, but can I say it like this? Oftentimes we don't understand. Okay, I'll, I'll say it more personal. Oftentimes I don't know the seriousness of what other people are going through around me, around us. 
So Jesus was left to cling on to the only one he could cling on to, the one. The only one who will never fail us, our Father in heaven. And as I've gone through some difficult times in my life, throughout the different phases in my life, the one that was always there is the one that I always am trying to tell you and want to give you an introduction to. And that is the one who loves us the most, uh, most our Father in heaven. I've talked about the three Hebrew children so many times recently. I'm just going to just allude to it, and you can go back and listen to one of the messages that I talked about it. But they had each other. They're the very definition of the three, all right? And yet, when they're going through this difficulty, they stuck together. And even in the fire, Jesus showed up. King Nebuchadnezzar said, we threw three in. I see four. And the fourth, this heathen man who didn't know anything about God, the fourth looks like the Son of God. Please bow your heads with me. This energizes me so much because Jesus loves us so much. He wanted to model a way for us to live life. And that is by investing in others and allowing them to invest in us. That we will be vulnerable with those people, we'll be intimate with those people, we'll be able to share the most intimate things of our lives of what's going on and really put our trust and our vulnerabilities out there, just like Jesus did. And even when they failed him, he still loved them. He still prayed for them. We need that in our lives. So I want to encourage you to be that person, number one. And number two, be like me and be on the lookout for your threes and for your twelves. But I think as much as it is to look for it, it is also the most important is to be that person. So if there's someone that they're not going to be in my three group, but I'm in their three group, I need to be supporting to them, even though I may not receive from that person, I'm going to give out to them. Now I've talked, as I often do, about the wonderfulness of God and the intimate personal relationship that he wants to have with you. And maybe you'd say, Pastor Kevin, I don't, I don't have that understanding of God and I, don't, I, don't, I, I can't relate to him like that. I want to invite you today to take that step. Maybe you've watched some of our other messages and you hit this part of the sermon and you just kind of like skip through or maybe you stop it here or, or whatever. But I encourage you to take that next step and that is to just try him out. Pastor Tad, who I've talked quite a bit about today, says this wonderful thing when he does an altar call. He goes, if I could take Jesus out of my heart and put him in yours just for a moment, the peace and the love and the understanding and just the everything you would experience, you would never want him to leave. Man, that is so descriptive and so poetic and so amazing to me, but it's absolutely true. So I'm going to ask you, can today be your day? I'm going to help you with the prayer. It's, it's simply to say this prayer after me. So if you will, I ask you to. I invite you to. Say, Father in heaven, I acknowledge that I am far from you. I've made some bad choices. I've done some things that I'm not even proud of. Right now, I choose to give up doing life my way. Here's the big one. And I surrender my life to you. And the best way I know how, I'm going to follow you. Show me lead me and guide me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now if that was you, if you prayed that prayer with me for the first time or maybe you're praying it again for a, a, a second, third, fourth, fifth time, I encourage you to take the next step because the same way that we need one another, you need to be involved with the church. 
and we would love to be that. And this is the way you can connect with us. No one's gonna spam you, no one's gonna show up at your house. You're not gonna get a free loaf of bread. This is our text communication system that we can, you can communicate with us and let us know that you said this prayer with us. And we'll let you know what your next steps are if you'd like to be a part. It's not about joining a church, it's about developing a relationship with God in a more intimate way. And you need help and steps to do that. That's part of us being part of your 12. Well, the ones that are, we may not be the closest one to you. We may be. But this is how we will help you. The way you do that is you text the word CONNECT to 469-289-1114. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for this message. It's so incredible to me, the example that Jesus left us, not only in paying the ultimate price, giving his life for mine, paying for my sins so I don't have to, but Jesus, you came and you modeled how to live for me. Thank you. And even as we see, you had the three closest ones to you, but you had the 12 that are around you and you're vulnerable with them and, and they let you down at times and, and they, they, you did life with them and that's what we need. Father, I pray that on several different levels, we will be challenged to be that to someone We'll be challenged to find those people in our lives, but even in a higher dimension that we will do that as a church and we'll have the connection one with another. Even though we're digital at the moment and when we have a building, it'll be easier, but that we will have this connection that we will have to show forth with, uh, with each other and to be there for each other. I give you all the glory and all the honor. I thank you for what is Belong Church and what is this your work that I'm trying my best to steward. Father, I speak blessings over everyone that is participating, that is watching these messages, that are paying their tithes and their offerings, that are giving, that are taking the action steps, that are listening and writing notes. Lord, I just speak a blessing over them. Lord, help them to become closer to you as you get closer to them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now watch to the end, which is right here, ways you can, for ways you can connect with us, you can find us on social media, and ways to give.